Okay. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we're live here at the Irish American Heritage Museum doing another hybrid event. So apologies um, if there's a slight delay between Facebook and ourselves here. We fixed the sound issue, so there should not be a sound issue um, on Facebook. And of course, you have to adjust the volume both on your own laptop, but also on the Facebook video itself. Sometimes the Facebook videos are set lower than what you think your actual uh, laptop is at. So you will not probably be able to hear the audience because they are not sitting in front of the microphone or the camera. So later on, when we come to questions and answers, you there will be silence. We will be here. Some people make speeches before they ask a question. <laughs> Try not to do that. <laughs> but, um, you know, that happens sometimes. So bear with us. If somebody makes a speech and then asks a question, we will tell you what the question is and you can listen to the answer from uh, Mr. Cole. And of course, use the chat feature yourself in, in Facebook to ask a question and, and we'll um, relay that to him. So we're delighted to have um, Paul F. Cole, the executive director of the Cade Milani House, um, which is a national historic site over in Troy. Uh, it's been a labor of love. I remember when I met Paul and Lynn two or three years ago when I came first and to see how the house has transformed even in that short space of time until of course the recent um horrible events which i'll let paul tell you about later on so it's very important that this house is preserved it's you know i'd say um what a lasting testament it will be you know to paul's work and as someone who works in a similar field this field of preserving irish american contributions it's so important that a local woman an irish immigrant um, you know, one of the few national labor leaders back in the day and one of the few immigrants who was acknowledged um, both on the National Historic Register, but also by the labor history people. You know, it's very important that this house is restored and kept. So I'm going to turn you over now to Paul, uh, who will tell us a little bit about her life story and her um, and, and the, his work at the over at the National Historic Site. So thank you, Paul. So you can. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to be here as a, a descendant of people from uh, County Tipperary. Uh, uh, this is always a wonderful uh, adventure to be here. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about a young Irish immigrant by the name of Kate Mullaney. Uh, she formed, the significance is that she formed the first bona fide all-female union in the United States in 1864. So we're going to talk a little bit about her background, about her family, uh, and about uh, her work in establishing the collar laundry industry. Uh, and then I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit, actually, about our efforts to uh, restore uh, her home on 8th Street in Troy, which has been really uh, quite, an, quite an adventure. Uh, the Kate Mullaney House is owned and being restored by a not-for-profit called the American Labor Studies Center. Uh, and it's, uh, is this, we're not, we're not moving here. There we go. Oh, it's up here. Okay. The American Labor Study Center. And, oh, okay. Now, at any rate, we'll get the technology worked out. As long as you can see it at home, that's the important thing. And in the audience, uh, uh, we can work with that. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the tradition here is really all about the labor movement, the, the labor movement in Ireland, but also my concern as a former uh, number two guy in the FLCIO in New York about the uh, history and the growth of the labor movement in New York and New York the United States and the role that uh, Irish uh, played throughout our history, uh, and of course, Kate Mullaney being key uh, key among them. So, the mission of the, let's go, we can go to the next. Oh, okay. So this is your okay, but what's? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so that's the American Labor Studies Center, uh, and we need to go to the next one. Okay. Well, it's not. Bear with us. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. That's work. Okay. No, it's not moving. Sorry, I'm 
There we go. Okay. There we go. Sorry for the uh, technology. We're in a day of uh, technology here, and uh, I apologize for that. But uh, from here on, I think it'll be smooth sailing. Um, Hubert Humphrey, vice, former vice president of the United States, once said, the history of the labor movement needs to be taught in every school in this land. America is the living testimonial to what free men and women organized in free democratic trade unions can do to make a better life of it. We ought to be proud of it. And so we're very proud of uh, the labor movement and we're proud of the people like Kate Mullaney who, who made it uh, happen. Uh, so this story tonight is about the legacy of a trade union woman pioneer in the United States. Uh, her, 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 okay, okay, I'm a trade union woman pioneer, okay, then, then I'm going to go to her early years, okay, uh, family, her family uh, emigrated from Roscommon uh, to England in 1837. Uh, Kate was born of Irish parents, Dominic and Bridget, about 1841. Uh, we think we get different dates. If you do uh, social history, you understand the problem with that. But we're pretty sure about 1838 or 41, some uh, now are saying it might have been closer to uh, 1838. Uh, so she was born in England, but of Irish parents. So she was a, a young Irish uh, girl. They sailed to New York, as you can see, in 1850. Uh, and uh, the Patrick Henry from Liverpool. Uh, next, uh, she arrived here, her family arrived here about, about 1853. You all know what was going on in Ireland in, uh, in those years with the famine and whatever. Uh, her parents were naturalized. They were naturalized in 1856. Uh, but then in 1864, uh, uh, Dominic died. Her mother was widowed in that year. Uh, they had three three sisters uh, together, Mary, Bridget, and Kate. And at first in Troy, they lived on 1st Street, then 2nd Street, then 3rd Street. It's not uncommon for uh, immigrants to move from one place to another. Next is a family tree. Now, I'm, I'm a little harder to show, but I'm going to just say that what you have here is uh, on, the, on the left, you have Mary Elizabeth uh, Mullaney. That's uh, the oldest sister. Uh, and then Catherine Mullaney, that's Kate. That's our Kate. And then the line between them shows her marrying a fellow by the name of John Fogarty. We'll talk a little bit about later. Uh, and then the youngest uh, sister, Bridget Teresa Mullaney. And you see she married a, a fellow by the name of John McMahon. And of all three sisters, Bridget's the only one that had any children. Uh, and it's the McMahons. Uh, there is some evidence that there are uh, descendants of the man still living in Troy. And, and if anybody has a genealogy bug, if they want to trace them down, we'd love to find them uh, because we do not have a picture of Kate Mullaney. Uh, and maybe if we get into some family history, maybe somebody would have it. So we're looking for uh, possibly descendants of Kate Mullaney who would be named uh, McMahon in Troy. Next, uh, the property uh, that we're going to talk about uh, tonight uh, was really uh, purchased in, uh, at 350 and 352 8th Street in 1864. That's the year of uh, the first strike for $650 in those days. And they moved into the third floor apartment at 350. This is a duplex there. It's a, it's a, a, a three-story, uh, six-apartment building. Now, if you think about the extent to which the Irish could own property in Ireland, for a widowed Irish mother to be able to buy this property, income producing property, was really quite a significant uh, achievement. Uh, they left uh, 8th Street to Kate when she died. Her mother died in 1876 for rents, profits, and income because that's where they did get income. Uh, and 352 8th uh, was left to uh, Mary, the other side of the house. Uh, 356 8th was purchased in 1874 to Bridget McMahon. So that's, yeah, that's just uh, uh, down the street on A Street a little bit. Next is, we'll get into the whole business that Kate was involved in. Uh, and it goes back to the invention of this detachable collar. Kind of an interesting story. Uh, in 1827, a woman by the name of Helen Lord Montague uh, was ironing her husband's shirt and almost cursing because she said, the only thing that's dirty is the collar. And I have to iron the whole shirt. She was complaining about that. 
And then uh, by some accident, the collar ripped a little bit and she tore off the collar and it was an aha moment. I don't have to wash the entire shirt. All I have to do is wash the collar and iron the collar. And that, believe it or not, is what led to this fantastic collar uh, laundry industry in, uh, in Troy, New York, the Collar City. Uh, it was uh, invented by a woman by the name of Helen Lord Montague uh, in 1827. And uh, then from there, it grew uh, initially in small uh, industries and it uh, grew after that. So it was first manufactured by a guy by the name Ebenezer Brown in 1829, and he had a, uh, a shop at 285 River Street in Troy. And some pieces were done at home because they're initially they're done at home, and then once uh, the Industrial Revolution took place, the collar laundry, the collar industry, like everything else, moved into uh, manufacturing. Uh, and so the machinery that developed led to the factories. And in the collar industry, that was 85% women. Now there are two stages. There's the production of the collar and later the cuffs uh, and then there's the laundry side to get them ready for to, to sell. And Kate worked in the collar laundry industry. Uh, now that was made up essentially of a couple of groups. The collar sewers, those were the what they call banders and runners and turners and the people who stitched the actual collar together. And they were made of very different, as time evolved, they were made of different materials. The laundresses was what Kate was were washers and starchers. They washed them, they starched the collars, and they had to iron them to prepare them uh, for sale. Now, that was a hard job because it involved caustic chemicals, uh, hot water, as you can see, bleach, rapid uh, work exposed workers to burns and other dangers. So it was a speed up system like you uh, found quite commonly in a, a number of factories in that period of, of time. And next, the working conditions again, during manufacturing, of course, they got dirty quite easily. So that meant the washing and the bleaching and the sulfuric gas and the boiling and rolling and starching and so on became uh, a very challenging and difficult job. Uh, oftentimes, the uh, factory would reach 100 degrees in heat, and for that, they were paid between uh, 1 and $3 a week and worked 12 to 14 hours a day not uncommon uh, in those days. Uh, and so the collar industry kind of represented what was happening in a number of other industrialized settings. So the factories then built up, you're probably quite familiar with the name Cluett uh, in Troy. So here is a, a, a picture of the Cluett Coon Company factory in Troy. And there were a number of them that were developed and the Cluett name became one of the most famous here in, uh, in Troy. Um, this is just a picture of a, doing a work at home of a woman making an arrow detachable collar. So sometimes they would, uh, you know, send them out to homes and then they would collect them and so on and so forth. So these two different versions of work went somewhat simultaneously, but ultimately became total, totally involved in the, in the manufacture in factories. And this is a simple, a simple example of uh, uh, what it would look like in one of those collar factories. Very crowded, very very uh, uh, familiar uh, setting in early manufacturing in the United States. Uh, the advertising made the difference. Now, the collars were largely white, stiff collars, uh, and so they made them kind of a prestigious thing. And from that, of course, was born the white collar job. He worked in a white collar industry. That came from here. And so I have here a couple slides that show that, uh, these famous collars. And they came in a lot of different varieties and styles. Most of them you see are quite simple. Uh, we have a number of the uh, shirts and uh, collars over at the Mulaney House, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so Arrow, obviously a very famous name, and uh, all kinds of shirts uh, were major producers at this time. Uh, and uh, the collars and cuffs, so you can see the image they're trying to project with the white collar. You know, uh, we're, we're middle class, we're upper middle class. Uh, and uh, eventually, as you can see, this guy had not, not only a, a detachable collar, but he had the uh, cuffs with him too. So we make a few more money, a little more money, if we can, if we can do the cuffs. Uh, and the advertising was quite significant uh, in the newspapers of the day. And so a number of the upper class really wanted fancier collars, and so the market responded to that. And this is what was known as Wilbur's five-fold collar, quite sophisticated collar. Next, they, interestingly, 
uh, the way they marketed them, they had very nice collar boxes, and, uh, and people have given me a couple of the collar boxes, and some of them were were really quite fancy, as you can see this one here, and that's where they that's where they would store them. Now that is the manufacturing of the collar. So literally thousands of women were working in this industry uh, in 1864, where really the activity begins. Now. Uh, Danny Walkowitz has written a book called Worker City Company Town, worth getting. Uh, Worker City was destroyed because it was organized, largely by the iron motors because of the iron stoves and so on that they made there. Uh, and Company Town was uh, uh, Cohoes, which had the mills within the traditional Company Town uh, environment. As you drive through near where, near where we're now living, you can see still this wonderful restoration of, of the uh, of the mills and the housing uh, over there. So the advantage the women had, these Irish women had, is that there was a very strong Iron Motors Union local number two, and they were mostly all Irish guys, Irish men. And so they were very supportive. They said, well, why are you putting up with these uh, conditions? You know, you ought to organize. And the, the most of the collar laundry workers in Troy were Irish, and, and the workers in Cahos, many of them were of English extraction or uh, Canadian uh, extraction. So in February of 1864, uh, with very poor pay and very tough working conditions that we described, uh, Kate Mullaney, along with really her partner, Esther Keegan, said enough is enough. We're going to organize and we're going to strike until we get better pay and we get better working conditions. Uh, and so we call this the first bona fide all women's union that had uh, as you can see, from two to 500 uh, uh, members in it, and they then uh, struck for better wages and working and uh, working conditions. Now, why we call it the first bona fide? There were other efforts around the country uh, in Lowell and so on where women might have gone out and protested and so on, but none of them really organized a sustainable union, and that's what the collar laundry workers did. That's the mo one of the most important, significant things to understand. Not only did they have a sustainable union, but they saw themselves as part of a broader labor movement. They saw them with their brothers in the uh, uh, iron molding industry and other workers. In fact, when they struck, people gave them money, and when they're in good shape, you'll see later, they gave money back to the others. They became part of what is now the uh, Troy Area Labor Council, for example, and participated in uh, the predecessor organization of the New York State AFL-CIO. So they saw themselves not as an individual union, but part of a movement. And that's very uh, important uh, consideration when we talk about the Troy Collar Laundry Workers versus the organizing efforts of many courageous women in a number of other places around the country. The first major strike was in 1864, and they were able to organize strikes in 14 laundries in a very cold week uh, in February. It lasted five and a half days. Now that's pretty significant because uh, sometimes you go out and it's hard to hold people out uh, in a day. You know, I got to feed my family. I uh, am I never going to get a job again? And so the solidarity that they demonstrated to stay out five and a half days. Uh, and Utah Phillips was the guy who came up with the slogan when Tom Carroll was giving him a tour of Troy, telling him about Kate Mullaney. He said, "Oh yeah." I know them. That's the one where the slogan would have been, don't iron while the strike is hot. Mm -hmm. So that came to became a, a, a legacy that has prevailed to this day and actually was the title of the musical that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. They actually won a 25% increase in pay, pretty significant. Uh, and they had tremendous support, again, from the Iron Motors Union, but also the entire community came out and supported these women, which was very important. Uh, okay. The organizer of the uh, of, uh, laundry union, Esther Keegan, who was her right-hand uh, person in uh, this whole thing, she was quoted as saying, the union was the mother of success, and their success was the mother of their commitment to trade unionism. So this is really taking shape when the Knights of Labor came together with the American Federation of Labor, and it was really uh, uh, the, the important seat uh, when we transferred from like guilds and so forth to and largely because of the nature of work in factories, people then began to develop some solidarity and saw trade unions as the way to improve their working conditions. Now, this is unbelievable. When they won the strike, they had a picnic 
4,000 people showed up, and uh, basically the purpose of the pit picnic was to thank the Aaron Motors for their support, uh, who gave them money and moral support and everything that they could do to uh, make sure that the women, many of them their wives or their sisters or their daughters, uh, probably in uh, this case. And significantly, uh, one of uh, labor history's great leader, great labor leaders, William Silvies, he was president of the Iron Motors Union. He came and uh, he addressed that picnic. He later became president of the National Labor Union, which was a predecessor to, uh, you know, as a national union, included the Iron Motors and some of the others. Uh, Esther Keegan uh, was, of course, as I said here, the a mother of uh, success was a success to the mother of unionism. Uh, then, if you wanted to see this uh, kind of a, an emotional impact, a number of years ago, we produced a musical called Don't Iron While the Strike is Hot. Uh, and we produced it over at Russell Sage College. Uh, and I don't know if any of you got to see it or not. Uh, but we did uh, videotape it. And if you go on the Kate Mullaney website, uh, which is here, KateMillaneyNHS.org. You'll see this picture of these women, which is a scene of them uh, showing solidarity just before the strike vote in 1864. Uh, you can see this musical, and it's really worth taking time to do it. We're looking at, at maybe doing something like that again in the future. A year ago, we did a uh, we had a grant from uh, the Capital District Arts Council to produce a smaller version. So we did that in schools in Troy. Schenectady and Albany and at the, at the uh, Troy Arts Center, uh, but it was a much smaller cast. So uh, hopefully someday we'll, we'll bring it back. But be sure to go on and take a look at the musical. It's really terrific. Okay. Oop. Now the key here, again, they're part of the labor movement. So one of the reasons for their success is that the iron molders and them supported them, but they supported them back. So they actually contributed $1,000 to the iron molders in 1866, the Colorado That's a lot of money. But that was their recognition to say, thank you for what you were. And there was a bricklayer strike in New York City in 1868, and they actually raised money for them. So again, what this demonstrates is their commitment to solidarity, to trade unionism, and to a movement, not just organizing an independent, standalone union. So they were praised all around the country for that. Um, in fact, uh, the president of the Women's Typographical Union, which was a pretty big union at the time, <clears throat> the quote is saying, it's been my pleasure to visit a real working women's association, the Collar Laundry Union of Troy. I use the word real to distinguish it from imaginary women's associations, which theorize, while this organization has proved that those who would free themselves must strike the blow. Now, I'm not going to tell you what organization she was talking about, women's organizations, but they weren't other trade unions by and large. Uh, now, she was recognized for her leadership nationally. In 1866, she was uh, elected second vice president of the National Labor Union, the one that William Silvey's formed and was the president of. However, I found out there was a bylaw that prohibited the state from having more than one officer. And the first vice president was also from New York. So she had relinquished that title, but Sylvia still wanted to have her as an officer. So she was appointed assistant secretary by Sylvia's. And that distinction made her really the first woman in America to serve as an officer of a national labor union. Uh, the national labor union that Sylvia's said here, uh, showing the significance of this, we now have a recognized officer from the female side of the house one of the smartest and most energetic women in America. And from the great work she has already done, I think it's not unlikely that we may in the future have delegates representing 300,000 working women. Well, we've got a lot more than that. In fact, a significant number of international unions and unions at every level are now led by women. So this, she was the, she was the person who really snowballed and rolled down the hill in terms of women's involvement in the American labor movement. Uh, in later events, uh, Mulaney led another strike uh, in 1866, and they got an increase in pay up to $14. Remember what I said earlier, they're making 2 and $3 a week, so that's a pretty significant percentage. Uh, in 1869, the laundry starchers successfully struck uh, for higher wages. That was just one of the units, uh, obviously, within the laundry industry. 
Uh, and the Colorado Labor Union demanded wage increases again for the ironers at that same uh, period of time. But they still held solidarity and they were together. Again, this financial support that helped them succeed was very strong union and community support. And again, a picnic of five to 6,000 people raised $1,200. Now, just think of that, having a strike here today and getting having a gathering of five or 6,000 people to support that strike at that time, absolutely significant. And uh, Mulaney and Esther raised $4,500. They went in New York City to do that. And of course, New York City historically has been a very strong center of the labor movement in the, uh, uh, in the country. Uh, the Iron Molders Local Tool donated. This was one of the reasons they could stay out. $500 a week as long as the strike shall last. Now, that is a very significant commitment. But if you know you're going to have that, you're going to you're be a little bit more self-assured that, hey, you know, I don't have to go, uh, I don't have to go in. One of my favorite people in Troy history is a guy by the name of Dugald Campbell. And he was a tavern owner. He was a journalist. And he was the president of Local Two of the Iron Boulders. And he was a vice president of what was then the New York State Working Men's Assembly. That is the organization which is now the state AFL-CIO that I retired as secretary treasurer from. So this is our early history of the organization that I have uh, uh, a lot of affection for. And he said, we will fight to a man to support our fellow working women who are now struggling for their just dues and their independence. So it shows the support of the entire labor movement and the support of men uh, now, by the way, not all men were really actively supporting women as much as we might think. This is this is almost unusual at this point in time to the degree to which it was there. Some said your job is to stay home and raise the kids and cook dinner, and maybe one or two of those left. I don't know. Uh, so, just Dugal Campbell was quite a poet, and he said here, "Sea labor's champion, so nobly contending." who fights for the downtrodden toilers the while, whose life wholly spent their condition amending despite every slanderer that would him revile. And they were slandered and reviled, certainly in the press in Troy at that time, many of them. There was a later uh, effort at a strike uh, and then there was a lockout and a fail. What happened is happens quite frequently. The, or, the, organ, the uh, manufacturer says, we got to organize. I mean, they're going to pick us off one uh, by one when we're not going to be able to survive. So the manufacturers formed a manufacturers association to develop some solidarity there as the only way they thought they could uh, uh, they could beat the uh, organizing. They recruited scabs from uh, people to come in and take the strikers place. Uh, they did extensive local negative advertising, especially in the local newspapers and if you go to the Troy Library you can find some of these stories. But what they then did is they said, okay, we're not going to send collars and cuffs to any organized laundry. The manufacturers who made them, we're going to send them to laundries that are not organized and try to undermine these efforts to organize. Um, and they criticized what they call outside busybodies. Long experience in the labor movement, when a group of people try to organize the companies, their big law firms come in and say, well, this is an outside, these aren't really your workers. This is an outside group that's coming in to organize these people to benefit themselves. Uh, and so that's a common uh, PR stack, uh, you know, strategy that uh, that they used. Well, it, it uh, didn't work here. Uh, so there was union busting, and this is what uh, Kate Mullaney uh, understood what was going on. She said, the employers were willing to increase pay but insisted that ironers, in this case, give up their union. And that's, uh, you have places uh, today, uh, there's a beer company in Pennsylvania that uh, they said, uh, you, you know, we, we'll give you the pay, but you've got, to, you've got to forego your union. If you don't do that, we're going to move to another town. Very common uh, union busting strategy. Did I skip one? Um, so what a lot of workers did in those days, uh, said, look, if the employers aren't going to treat us well, we're going to we're going to take over the industry ourselves. We're going to form a cooperative, and we're going to we're going to produce the collar lawn, the collars, and we're going to launder the collars, and we're going to sell them. And they did this in different industries. Uh, they thought they were better alternatives to workers in theory, uh, I guess, in philosophy that might be true, but they are very hard to organize and sustain, as most of them have found out, and most of them uh, failed. 
and the manufacturers retaliated against these cooperatives because they wouldn't support them. They, you know, let's say, had a place that wanted to make uh, collars, and people who supplied them other manufacturers then would kind of blackball them, so they couldn't do it. Well, Sylvie's uh, great labor leader, he died, uh, this great supporter of the uh, Collar Laundry Union, at a very early age, 41. And in 1869, the Collar Laundry Union uh, actually dissolved. Not uncommon, but it, it, remember, it, it was lasted for five years and was part of the labor movement, a great significant achievement. But it became a model for successive efforts of women to organize. One of the first of those was the Joan of Arc Assembly of the Knights of Labor and other women's uh, labor unions. And uh, the Knights of Labor was the labor movement now, the American Federation of Labor was uh, uh, an organization of individual unions who, who kept their identity. The Knights of Labor was like the Wobblies, one big union. Everybody's welcome. Everybody except lawyers and bankers uh, could join the, uh, the Knights of Labor. Uh, and so the, that became a model for the Joan of Arc Assembly at the Knights of Labor and other women's unions. Uh, when we get the Mulaney House up and running, we have posters for each of these strikes, and we have a poster on the Knights of Labor and their role in the Knights of Labor, so you could uh, find out a lot more about that. Uh, Kate's later life, uh, we know what happened to her. I assumed uh, much of the iron industry moved to Pittsburgh and Buffalo. I figured she married a guy by the name of John Fogarty and moved with him. Absolutely wrong. Uh, Lynn and I have good friends in Pennsylvania who are genealogists, and, she, uh, I, and they do uh, reenactments, so they're in Fort Niagara. She said, I'll track down Buffalo and see if I can find her, and she did. And she found her marriage certificate uh, in St. Joseph's Cathedral, uh, where she married J John Fogarty, who was a marbleizer. I went to marbleizer. A marbleizer is something that makes a wall look like marble. Uh, so I don't know if we have such a thing anymore. Um, and the, this, this, we, and Lou Ann found this one story that we just never knew. Uh, and that is that Kate Mullaney opened up a laundry uh, on Eagle Street in, uh, in Buffalo called the Troy Laundry. Uh, and it employed, as you can see here, what she, she found an article in a, a business journal. You know, they had business journals over a period of time. And so they would, uh, different industries. Industry, they do a story on an industry. So she found this story about the Troy Laundry that Kate Mullaney organized and said here it was uh, employed 27 skillful laundresses for the best wages. Uh, its garments were done up in a superior style and without injury. Uh, the annual business made $20,000 a uh, year, which was a phenomenal amount of uh, money at those times. And uh, the article said, it deserved the prosperity that has attended uh, her, uh, Kate Mullaney's efforts. And there's a picture of it. In that article was actually a pen and pencil a drawing of the uh, Troy Laundry on Eagle Street. And the paper said it was the neatest and best arranged factory in the country. So here, Kate Mullaney going from rebel rousing trade union leader to an employer but an employer who understood the respect, the dignity and rights of the workers and treated them very well and did what she could to operate a good business. Amazing story, I think. Uh, later in life, uh, her mother did die in 1876. And here's where I mentioned she married uh, John Fogarty uh, in, uh, in St. Joseph's Cathedral. It's a place where I got my Boy Scout on Altair Day Award back when I was a scout in Western New York. Uh, Kate died. Uh, back here in uh, Troy on August 17th in 1906 at the Mulaney, uh, at the Mulaney House. And she's buried at St. Peter's Cemetery uh, on Oakwood Avenue. Some of you can stop by and see that. A number of years ago, 1999, I think Jack probably remembers this, uh, all, all they had in the ground was a little uh, thing in the ground, of Kate Mulaney. And the, and the Irish community and the labor community said, this will not stand. And so they got together and they uh, put together a uh, huge 12-foot Celtic cross on Kate Mulaney's website. So if you go up uh, Husik and turn left on 10th and then break off to Oakwood and you go down on the cemetery Oakwood's on the right, you'll actually see this. It's pretty close to the road. Uh, and then uh, a bigger, that's what it looks like from the road. So a little later we put uh, benches uh, there. And there's some story there of Kate and uh, 
Uh, we have Don Iron while the strike is hot is engraved somewhere, I think, on one of the stones. Um, so to continue the organizing, uh, what happened then is that just like the suffragettes, uh, who were really later in the, in the story, and that, by the way, that's a fascinating story of the relationship between the suffragettes and the, the Kate and ladies of the world. Uh, Kate met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and uh, there was places when Katie would go to, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton would go to union meetings and so on, and they, they would have some dialogue. In fact, in the musical, there is a dialogue between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, uh, and Kate Mullaney. So uh, the Working Women's State Labor Union of New York uh, was formed and supported unions and cooperatives, including more strikes by collar laundresses and others as uh, time went on. And Emmeline, uh, uh, one of the preeminent women at the time, said, working women should organize from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Capital must be made the servant of labor and not the master. Now, the Joan of Arc Assembly I mentioned, I'll go through this uh, quickly. That was 1886, the Knights of Labor. I talked a little bit about this and the praise that they had and the strikes and lockouts became mixed. The assembly disappeared, and but women point is they continue to organize right up to this very day. So she was really the precursor of, uh, of the growth of women in the labor movement. Now, Kate Mullaney has been widely recognized for this. Uh, in 2000, in the National Women's Hall of Fame, she was inducted, and this is the medal that we have at the Mullaney House, it says, as a labor leader and organizer, Mullaney is one of early American labor history's most important women. Uh, and then just uh, in 19, uh, 2016, she was inducted into the International uh, Labor Hall of Fame, uh, which is in Detroit. Some of you know, might know Michael Barrett there, who from the uh, Burn Iron Works, who uh, uh, was there as we accepted the, and the lady to the left was the Consul General of Ireland, who came up here and uh, was very supportive. Yeah. So the house, so that's the Kate Mullaney story, and uh, we can get back to that if you have some questions, because there's a, a lot to her. Um, in, it was designated a National Historic Landmark uh, by the Secretary of the Interior in 1998. And uh, what happened was that people were, because I was a school teacher and I got involved in the teachers union, and I thought the idea is that kids all learn more about the labor movement, so I had one foot in labor and one foot in education. And, and see, so they said, you should know about this Kate Mullaney. Uh, and, you know, her house is historic. And so maybe we can get it designated a National Historic Landmark. Sounds good to me. At that time, we talked to uh, then Congressman Michael McNulty, a good Irishman. And we, uh, we went down to visit him. And he said, I have no idea how to make a landmark. Right across the hall was a congressman from Minnesota, Bruce Vento, who was chairman of the Interior Committee. So we said, we'll go over and visit him. And we said, how do we do this? He says, well, I can just see him now, lean back. He said, is it kind of hard? It has to be 50 years old, nationally significant. But then he, he just rolled his eyes and says, you know, there are, the National Park Service does national theme studies. They will do a theme study. They'll sponsor it to solicit nominations for a National Historic Landmark in the Underground Railroad and a number of other things. Why don't I introduce a bill into Congress requiring the National Park Service to do a national theme study on sites important to American labor history. Oh, of course. <laughs> uh, so uh, he did that, and I happen to be uh, fairly good uh, friends with another good Irishman by the name of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who picked it up in the Senate, uh, and they too sponsored it, and it became a law. Bush one signed it. And I was one of three labor leaders appointed to the National Park Service Advisory Board to oversee this study, which was a great job because we met in all the national parks. Uh, and so we put together this uh, uh, study, and a number of nominations came in, including we hired someone to do the Kate Mullaney nomination. It's on the website. It's very well done by Rachel Blivin. By the way, the uh, Cohoes Mastodon Bill uh, came in as a result of that. So a number of sites around the country of interest to labor then became national historic uh, landmarks as a result of that theme study. It also then was uh, added to the Women, uh, Women's Heritage Trail in New York in 207. The significance there is the only one that deals with working class history. Now, if you're rich or famous or famous politician, there are all kinds of national historic landmarks and sites and so on all over the place. There is a dearth of places for working people. And so that's the significance in terms of state recognition. Um, 
And I'm sure some of you might remember the dedication as a National Historic Landmark in 1998 when uh, then First Lady Hillary Clinton came and did the dedication. Unfortunately, I was a convention of the American Federation of Teachers where I served as a vice president for many years, so I couldn't be there. Uh, and uh, that's an interesting story. Hillary told me this herself. She said it was, she was on a tour of Save America's Treasures, historic sites that were threatened. Uh, and she was meeting with her staff and they were giving her all these important places. You gotta go here, you gotta go there. And there was a, also run list. And one was the Kate Mulaney House. So she, she said, tell me about that. You don't wanna go there. She's not that important. She was just a worker and she was in a, you know, a, a depressed neighborhood in a, you know, upstate New York City. Why would you wanna go there? She says, that's exactly why we are going there. Uh, and she came and of course there's a huge crowd there. Her her speech is on our website. is well worth reading because essentially she said, look, it's important we recognize our military heroes and our political heroes and our business heroes. Just as important we recognize the people who made this country run and make it work. The Kate Mullenies of the world. The wonderful, wonderful statement she made. And she was uh, wonderful for a bunch of other reasons. So that was dedicated uh, on, in July by uh, Clinton. And if you go by the house, you'll see that plaque out on the uh, in front. And there's her speech, which is essentially what I said today. It's important. I won't read the whole thing to you. Uh, uh, it's important that we recognize the Kate Mullaney's of the world uh, as well as the other people. So that's what made America different and that's what made America great that we recognize these kind of people. Uh, so then, you know, there are four, you, there are four levels in the National Park uh, Service. There's National Register, National Landmark, National Site, and National Park. Once you become a national landmark, they pose the question, is it significant enough to be raised to a national strike site? The difference is if you're a national strike site, you are a unit within the national park system. Very hard to get it. So that study came up and the park service said, no, no, not significant enough. And uh, we would have to spend a lot of money. We got a lot of money. We don't can't, you know, manage the ones we got. Well, I was crying on Hillary's shoulder one day. She said, well, we'll solve that. We'll just introduce a bill into Congress making it a national historic site. <laughs> so Mike McNulty was there again. And sure enough, she did that. She wrote that bill all the way through, testified before the committees and everything else on it. Uh, and uh, this one, she was senator. And uh, it passed um, in 2004. And uh, it was signed by then Bush II uh, to make it a national historic site. Now, we made one compromise. Uh, most National Strike sites are owned, operated, and funded by the National Park Service. Uh, we said, well, we still want to be a National Strike site, but they said, okay, we'll make it an affiliated unit. You'll, you'll be, have all the prestige, you'll be a unit within the National Park System, but you have to run it. You have to buy it, and you have to restore it, and you have to run it. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Now, this all started about 30 years ago. I started this project in 1988. That's about 89 is when we went to visit Mike McNulty in, uh, in Washington. So there's the neighborhood. I won't spend a lot of time on this. I think most of everybody knows where it is, but it was uh, right off who's a street on, uh, on 8th Street, uh, working class neighborhood. One of the things that was very helpful uh, is to get the support of a nationally prominent historic architect. And we are very fortunate to have one here in Albany, uh, Jack Waite and Jack Waite Associates. And so he was very helpful and uh, uh, he's the one who put together uh, the Historic Structure, Structures Report, HSR, uh, in 2010. And that said, this is the history of it. This is what we have to do. And here, if we're gonna restore it, this is how we go about doing that. So that became our, our you know, our Bible, so to speak, of how to proceed uh, with the restoration of the Mulaney House. So having said that, we had these plans. Uh, we were able to buy the house uh, in, thanks, by the way, to uh, the help of then Senator Joe Bruno, whose district this was in. And it helped that we were involved in the state AFL-CIO. We had a pretty good relationship uh, with them. And so we were able to buy the house for $55,000, just the right side. We still only own the right side. Uh, if we ever uh, get money to buy the other side, we would restore those apartments uh, and they would extend the boundary of the national landmark and national site to that. So that's a long-term goal. At 82, I'm gonna leave it to people like you to th think more about getting that accomplished. But 
So we have the three floors. Now, all right, what are we going to do with the three floors? Well, we visit lots of places. The most important thing is that we the outside of the building would have to look like it was when she's there. The, the simple uh, thing is, if she came back, would she recognize it? If she went into the house, would she recognize it? Yeah, this is where I live. Uh, and so I'll show you later some work we did on the outside. But if you walk in the front door, the, the historic stairwell has all been restored to what it looked like in 1869 when uh, she built the house. Uh, and there was a debate whether she lived on the first floor or the top floor. Well, I made an executive decision said I think she lived on the third floor. Uh, and uh, largely because it had four bedrooms. Uh, but also, what I wanted to do is have the first floor, because I visit a lot of places that have uh, exhibits. So the first floor is an exhibit. That's where we have our posters about Kate Mulaney and the collars and the cuffs and all that kind of stuff that tells the story. We also have an exhibit on the Irish of Labor that uh, some of you may remember Joe Dolan, who worked uh, you know, in this organization for a number of years, put together a wonderful uh, flat panel exhibit on the Irish of Labor. So we reproduce that, and that's on the first floor. So on the first floor is all exhibit. It's the exhibit, so you walk in and say, this is Troy, this is the Irish movement, and here are you know, the posters on Kate, here are uh, collars and cuffs and so on. And uh, that's all, uh, that's there. So that's the introduction to people. Uh, then on the second floor, uh, that's the, what the exhibit area looks like. Uh, they're uh, still on the first. There's a lot more stuff in there now, because we've been working on that. The second floor, uh, uh, the, the place that run these, the Labor Studies Center, has to have a, a space to run the place. So we decided to make the, turn that into an office, so where we can have all our labor books and uh, resources and records on Kate Mullaney and so on. So that's essentially the two two main rooms on this second floor. The third floor was a challenge. So we said, all right, this is where Kate Mullaney lived. Now, now keep these in mind because this is what it looked like when we bought it and this was what we had to restore to what it looked like in 1869. So this was what the stairwell looked at. It actually was breaking away from the wall at that point in time. And we did, by the way, have a, a archaeological uh, phase 1B study done. Uh, it came up some some stuff, but where we want to go is there was a privy right in the middle of the backyard. And they say, that's where we want to dig because that's where everybody threw everything and that's where the history is. So at some point, maybe we'll get an architect's back and uh, maybe even construct after that a, a privy with a sign of this is because they had no plumbing, no, no running water, no electricity or anything at that point in time. Next to it, uh, the goal is uh, the uh, corner of 8th and Hoosick. We were able to buy that. There was a, a a Jiffy Loop there. Remember some of you used to come down 9th Street through the Jiffy Loop and out? Uh, and we purchased that in uh, 2004, again, thanks to our good friend, Senator Joe Bruno, and we demolished it in 2005. And what we're planning now, uh, we've done quite a bit of landscaping there that I think you'll see. Uh, but the goal is to take a little corner of the backyard and create a memorial to trade union women pioneers. Uh, maybe like a brick wall and put plaques in or something. We, we're trying to think about that design now. And for example, my own union, the teachers union, the first president was a woman. We might want to nominate her to be inducted, you know, one year. And hopefully the union will give us a lot of money to do that. Uh, so uh, that's what uh, we're, we're doing there. So that's a future plan. And this was a, a Pretty fancy drawing we had made of, made of what the park would look like. But that shows you the uh, the houses in the upper left-hand corner in the backyard. You can see where Privy would be. Uh, and then we own all the way from 8th to 9th Street because when we bought the, uh, the Jiffy Loop, we bought the property from 8th up to 9th because that's where the cars came in. So that, uh, that helped. So these are, I'll go through these a little more quickly. There's the Jiffy Loop. Uh, before it was torn down, there's the Jiffy Lube after that. And notice the color of the house then, it was blue. Uh, and this is the operating engineers. Now, I gotta give a commercial here, I'm sorry. Uh, when you get a grant, you normal grants, you have to match 50%. Since this is in a depressed part of Troy, you have to match with 25%. Where am I gonna get that? The first grant we had was $130,000 to shore up the south wall. No restoration at all. 
uh, and other grants. The last one we got was a quarter of a million dollars, so I had to come up with $60,000. I have a fundraiser every year that raises about 18000 How do I do that? Fortunately, grants from the state parks allow for donated labor and donated material. So the president of the Capital District Building and Construction Trades just happens to be on my board. Uh, and so they have done a measurable amount of volunteer labor. The painters painted the building twice, and the operating engineers came in and did all of this work. Uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, I submitted uh, paperwork of, of donated labor for $68,000, give you an idea of the, of the impact that these uh, people have had. This is more work by the operating engineers. And, and, uh, by the way, the, the landscaping has all been designed by a uh, uh, landscape architect from Cornell. It's overgrown now. It's kind of raising the money to make sure. Certainly before we have a grand opening, we'll clean it up pretty nice. Uh, uh, and that's what it looked like, you know, after they got finished. Here's a couple of bricklayers doing work down in the basement. Uh, these are probably carpenters doing other work inside, third floor work. That's the damage that had to be repaired that I talked about uh, with the first grant that we had. Uh, and the south, south wall repair. And that's after all that work was done. Uh, and then the windows, the, we had, when you restore the windows, you couldn't just go get them at uh, Pella or somewhere. The, they have to be specially made. So we had to hire a guy by the name of Devin Dasher, who's a historic window maker. So he put in six windows in the south wall of that 130000 that cost us $17,000 for, for those six windows, to give you an idea what it cost to do historic uh, preservation. Uh, and there's the, uh, when the windows were put in. Uh, and there's an inside view, the beautiful windows. And they have kind of, a, you know, they have a ripple in them, just like the windows did. And after we were finished doing the landscaping and, and the painters painted the place, that's what it looks like now. So it's really pretty amazing. We wanted to go back to the original brick, but we couldn't because of the purging and everything. So the National Park Service said, color, painted this color. So everything has to be done according to the rules and regulations of both the state a historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service. And then you can see the landscaping that we've done around it that, uh, that consistent with what Cornell said. We have skilled labor, uh, Tracy Lee of Duncan and Cahill, uh, who's our contractor, just happens to be a woman, Irish woman owned company uh, in Troy, about a block away from the Mulaney House, that done wonderful work. And he came in, he handcrafted 14 doors because the doors had to look exactly like they did in 1869. Give you an idea of the kind of detail here. And the, the, the same thing with the stairwell. It was, it's all broken, torn away, and all the carpenters had to come in and they had to do this, uh, this work to restore the stairwell. It was really in bad shape. Uh, this is what the kitchen looked like when we were uh, restoring it. And the building trades have every day, every year, a national day of service. So these are all these people came in on one day uh, you might know the one guy in the beige suit, uh, Neil Breslin. Uh, he, he was there just to be uh, helpful at the time. It was, was great about it. And the guy uh, to his left is Jeff Stark, who's the head of the building and uh, trades council and uh, member of my board and super, super guy. Uh, and there he is actually doing a lot of work himself, uh, plastering the walls. And there's Neil actually doing some work, more than a photo op. Uh, and uh, uh, John McDonald, uh, who's a, a, you know, a local assemblyman, who's been helpful. And these are the uh, uh, electrical workers who came in and did all, had to do all the electrical work. Uh, because remember, it didn't have any plumbing, it didn't have any, uh, well, they had plumbing uh, later on, and elect but all had to be, uh, all had to be redone. And these are the District 9 painters, uh, plastering the walls, uh, they all had to be done. And here's a roof. Um, talk about volunteer labor. Uh, Pasmino Roofing does, uh, I think, a lot of the roofs uh, at the Capitol buildings. They're out of Springfield, Massachusetts, unionized company. And so with the sheet metal workers and a roofers union, and Pasmino came in and put a whole new uh, roof on the Mulaney House, uh, $27,000 didn't cost me a nickel. So that kind of stuff really made it all worthwhile. And there's some of the work they're doing on the, uh, and, and including bringing the stuff in with the heavy equipment. That's what the roof looks like today. Um, and then here's, the, these are just some of the Duncan and Cahill people and Jack Wake architects who have been working on it. And then we had to do the restoration of the back porches. So they all had to be torn down apart and right down to the basics. 
uh, that was fifteen thousand dollars just to do the back porches and then that's the outside what about the inside well, a number of years ago, I went, now some of you might be familiar with the Tenement Museum in Lower East Side, New York. We went down there, and the last apartment they had done was of an Irish family, the Moore family, 1869, same year Kate Mulaney built the house. I said, do you ha happen to have a furnishing study? And they did, because I was impressed with what they had. And they let Jack Waite have it, and he produced one for the Mulaney house. That, by the way, that's on the website. And people have looked at that, and I've gotten uh, like a, a kitchen table and other stuff people say well I got one of those and they'll call up and say would you like that because everything here has to be original we have no reproductions in there uh, so all the furnishings are original and so if you go to the furnishing studies you will you will see that uh, and then we had Jack come up with these plans and this was his vi vision of it and this is what it looks like today this is the parlor on the first floor or the third floor of the Cape Mulaney house and all those things were donated um, you know, uh, to us, which were just absolutely wonderfully amazing. Um, there's another picture of the uh, uh, of the parlor. The wallpaper is a uh, replica of an original that they found somewhere in Wyoming or something like that. Uh, and we have a uh, iron stove. Uh, we need to get the uh, piping to go up to the wall. Uh, but uh, so that that'll finish that room. Uh, the kitchen. Uh, there's a design for the kitchen, and there's what the kitchen looks like. Beautiful. And but in the kitchen, uh, we're missing, um, if anybody got any contacts, uh, Troy built our iron uh, cooking stove. Uh, and not too big, but not too small. And we can't, you know, they're, they're around. I go on Google and uh, places and look for them. Uh, but that's one thing that we're going to have to have before we open it up. And that'll go just to the left of the chair. That's the table I talked about, ladies, said I have one of those, and you can have it. Uh, the little chairs around the outside, a woman called and said, I've got six cane chairs made in Troy, New York in the 1800s. Would you like them? They were estimated at $100 each. I said, sure. So she brought them, uh, and when she got there, she said, how about 300 It was very nice. Uh, and that's the, the bedrooms are, are really challenged because they're so small. Uh, and this gives you an idea what they would look like. Uh, but here is a... Uh, a picture of that. Uh, there are no, we don't, there are, we don't have beds small enough. There are no beds in the bedroom. If somebody says they're called Jenny Lynn beds or something. They're very tiny beds. So we're really looking for four small beds. We may have to have the carpenter build something and then put the coverings on them. I hope we don't have to do that. So it's the Troy build stove and four small beds. If you have any contacts, let us know. That's what we need. But all these other things were given to us. Uh, and by the way, they all have to be approved. We can't just take them. Uh, Doug Booker, who uh, some of you may know, worked for Jack Waite. Uh, he is the expert on um, furnishings. So anytime he says, uh, yeah, I have something, would you want it? I send it to Doug, and he says, thumbs up, thumbs down. He said, no, that's 1890. That's uh, too late or something. You can't, can't have that. So everything is uh, original. Then what happened? We were, we were ready to open within weeks, probably, once we got the stove. Uh, and everything's all set. The exhibits were all done. The office was all done. Uh, and the apartment was pristine and historically restored. And it was just beautiful. And on uh, November 30th, a lady, young woman, got cut off up at 9th and Hoosick and went right down the hill, right in the back door. And <laughs> this is uh, the, the outside view is uh, to the left and the inside view is to the right. Uh, where are we now? Well, Jack Wake came in and said, this is $150,000 worth of damage. I said, oh, really, I can't believe it. So he drew, did the drawings, and Duncan and Cahill came up with $158,000. Uh -huh. We went to the insurance company. They sent an adjuster. He said, $58,000. So right now, we're $100,000 apart in terms of, uh, if I have a good Irish lawyer, Patrick Hannigan, who's my first cousin, who's working on this, and we may end up in court because uh, everything has to be done. We had a, another adjuster there, and Jack said, "You just can't put regular bricks up there. These, you know, these are these are because this has to be not, not just restored. It's like it was before the accident. It has to be restored historically accurately, because we have a covenant with the state parks. If we don't do that, they want the money back. That's a pretty big incentive, uh, and it has to be done according to the standards of the national and state uh, and state parks. 
So that's the story of where we're at today. There are two wonderful books I'd recommend to you. Uh, the first one is by the uh, expert on, uh, on Kate Mullaney, Carol Turbin, who we've met and has been up here a number of times, called Working Women of the Collar City, Gender, Class, and Community in Troy uh, during Kate Mullaney's time. The other is uh, Danny Walkowitz, who I had lunch with uh, a number of months ago. Uh, the professor at NYU wrote a book called Worker, Worker City Company Town, Iron and Cotton Worker Protest in Troy and Cahoes, 1855 and 1884. And then there's another book about Albany during this time. So this is a wonderfully rich history, uh, the growth of industry and the, the comparison uh, between uh, uh, Troy and Cahoes, and both unique. And Albany, I don't want to keep Albany out because I'm sure Jack could come up and talk about three hours on the history of Albany and, and the same issues that were here because it had an iron industry and it had uh, other kinds of manufacturing as well. So I don't want to, uh, you know, dismiss, uh, dismiss the, the important role that Albany played in all of this as well. It's just that we're focusing on Kate and she happened to be in Troy, so that's where our, our emphasis is. But those are two great books. Uh, and here are your online resources. Uh, first, the Labor Studies Center is really designed for teachers. You want uh, you want to be able to integrate somewhere. You have to teach something. You have to teach uh, Black history. Why not A. Philip Randolph? You have to teach uh, women's history. Why not Kate Mullaney? In other words, you have to teach these things. Why not draw lessons from the history of the labor movement? And th that website has loads and loads and loads of resources for K-12 teachers. So not only them, but uh, union members, apprenticeship training programs, and parents and kids. You know, one of the big frustrations is that so many kids uh, have parents who are union members and they never even talk about their union or what they do or anything else. Even though the recent trends now are very good, approval of labor is up to about 68%, I think, in the country now, and but we're still suffering a massive uh, uh, hostility from uh, the right wing and uh, and others. So if you want to make a uh, contribution, it's at the bottom. Uh, the, the, the checks are made out to the American Labor Studies Center, not the Kate Mullaney House, and they have to be sent to uh, uh, Slocum and DeAngelis, who's our accountant out on uh, Albany Shaker Road. So that completes uh, the story, and it's just the beginning of the story of women in labor history, and I'm delighted you were able to come, and to our audience who's watching online, thanks so much for uh, your patience. I guess, uh, Madam Executive Director, we're going to uh, take questions now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> already. Um, online. I'm just going to stop sharing this and then you, you stay here so they can see okay. you online still. Uh, let me remove one So I should have said when we came on first um, that this is the first one of our, it's a new series that we're doing, which has been sponsored by the Hudson um, River Valley National Heritage Area. So this is lecture one in a, in a series of lectures and um, panel discussions. We actually have a musical presentation next month. And the series is called Collars, Canals and Conflagrations, the Irish in the Capital Region. So there'll be a couple of these kind of um, talks coming up. And thank you to our sponsors. Uh, so questions online. No one has asked yet. Just someone said she missed um, what had happened about the vehicle. So, yeah, someone came off the road. They were kind yeah, of rearranged yeah, or pushed in yeah. and, and drove in the back. Um, so does anyone in the audience, and I'll, I'll monitor Facebook, but if anyone in the audience has a question. Yes. The pictures uh, when we found our first house in Albany in March 1985. Our next door neighbor was Josephine Stano, who had been the head of the teachers' union. Josephine, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting story because I was at an AFT convention, so we had to have somebody host it, and uh, great uh, Hillary. So Josephine, over at that time, was president of the Albany County Federation of Labor. So yeah, so I invited her to uh, do it, and she did a great job. And uh, by the way, we have. Uh, one of the things I'll mention, uh, I was a, a trustee at Cornell, so I saw people were um, paying millions of dollars for naming buildings. I said, why can't I name rooms? Uh, so I had one very generous couple do the uh, uh, parlor. And then after that, I said, okay, $1,000 will name a room for you. Yeah. All the rooms are named. All the rooms are named. Uh, and one interesting one, I get people who call and want to go through the Mullaney House. I'll do them, normally I'll go over there. But one of the worst things the Park Service ever did is they had these uh, stamp books. You go and you get a stamp. So people want to come to the Millennium House. They don't care about Cape Millennium. They just want their books stamped. 
I try to I try to separate them out and, uh, and not go. But one guy from Springfield, Illinois, was interested, and he said, "Yeah, I'd like to come over." I said, "Okay, I think he's really interested." He did. The good thing I did, because he came over and he said, "What are these little signs?" I said, "If somebody donates something, I say the restorations room is made available by a generous contribution by." He says, "You have any rooms left?" I said, "Yeah, I've got the kitchen. I'll take the kitchen, thousand dollars." So I've got to be a little more careful, uh, but. But uh, we're, we're, once we, hopefully, we're going to win this war with the insurance company and get the restoration done, and uh, maybe next spring, next summer, we'll have a gala uh, grand opening of the place and uh, cut ribbons and have all kinds of important people there. And uh, uh, the idea here is for people to come in and understand why people organize, why they form a union, and, uh, this, and so that's one part of it. Uh, it's... This, by the way, this is the only national historic site in the whole country, as I said, I think I said, that focuses on women's history, labor history, and Irish immigrants history all rolled into one. The only one. There are 88 national historic sites, and this is the only one that brings those themes together. That's why it's important and why we get it done so we can tell that story. Oh, I have a fundraiser. Well, yeah, we'll, that'll be on the website. Uh, in December, we have an annual fundraiser where we give medals out to the people who've... Uh, I had a Kate Mullaney medal cut, cut. One side is the National Park Service logo, and the other side is the Labor Studies Center. Uh, and we normally award uh, th three medals. So the, uh, if you're interested in that, but uh, uh, anything, anytime is uh, appreciated. Yeah, so we, I'll see it last summer, you know, it was open kind of a, a dry run, and um, Siobhan, one of our members, said she had visited then too, but didn't realize that there had been the accident. So yeah, that was mm -hmm. absolutely horrific. I gave a talk last week on a slightly later period, you know, Irish women in the labor movement, like um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Mother Jones and stuff. So it's amazing how early these, like this is, you know, 50 years before the uh, Bread and Roses strike and all that. So it's amazing how active, you know, the community up here were, I suppose, needs must, you know. <laughs> Uh, any other questions? There's nobody on Facebook asking a question, but uh, yeah. In two weeks, uh, I'll be hosting and leading a ride, and it's called the um, Industrial Revolution Bicycle Tour. Oh, nice. And we're coming to Kate Mullaney's house. Oh, good. Before I knew you were giving a talk, uh, it occurred to me to include people of color and women, besides people like, you know, Burden and Skyler and yeah. Ben Rensselaer. The guys well, let me know because it's you know it's so, it's not open for uh, visits right now because of the restoration. But we can take people through now, so it depends when you're going to be there. If I uh, if I'm unavailable, Tom Carroll, a member of my board and a great well, uh, local historian, will will do that. Really yeah, I'll give give my card after this, and you can. Did you see, it's a bike uh, cycling tour of yeah, of labor. Yeah, no, I Oh, oh, okay. The friendly neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a good escape uh, ramp down to the River Street from your house. Mm -hmm. We've had a number of we've had a number of groups here, including from this organization, the Irish Genealogical mm -hmm. Society, uh, Girl Scout troops, senior citizen groups, and so on. Will mm -hmm. and for that, we'll uh, you know we'll conduct a tour. But mm -hmm. uh, until the accident, uh, everything was there to show people, except the few items that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to do one plug. We're doing this for the Hudson River Valley Ramble. Oh, good. So there's a Hudson River Valley Ramble. When did you say that's happening? It is uh, the 26th. The 26th of September. And they're meeting out front here at the Visitor Center in Albany. Yeah, um, meet out front here. Okay, good. Oh, great. Yeah, it's about the 15th or 20th ride they've done. So if anyone, what's the name of the Hudson River Valley Ramble? So Google that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Well, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, any other questions or comments? Jack, any uh, thing I missed or you want to embellish? There is a difference between Albany and Troy. And one of the reasons is not which industry or which immigrant group was surviving first in one or another, but also there was more sectarian. Uh, it, you know, you had, a, uh, you had a draft riot in Troy that you didn't have in Albany, mm -hmm. and you had a lot of uh, uh, Catholic, Protestant, and particularly Scotch-Irish 
Okay. And I had found an old city directory around the turn of the century, this wasn't ancient, and I was surprised there were a number of orange orders mm -hmm. in Troy, and to yeah. my knowledge, there has never been an orange order everywhere in the city of Albany. So the, uh, the city of Troy has a, a, a tension, which is extraordinary, and everywhere in the country, but not so much as in Troy. And, you know, uh, Jack, uh, uh, Jack's book on the, uh, uh, you know, the Jack Casey's book on the uh, trial of Jack Shea, for example, mm -hmm. brings out in the 1890s this, uh, this extraordinary uh, sectarian rivalry between the owners, the owners' managers, and hirings, and organized labor. And it shows up throughout all yeah. of Troy at a much deeper and much more intense uh, way than it ever shows up in Albany. Yeah. I, I should mention that we're establishing a relationship. Uh, I've been uh, a long fan of uh, James Connolly. I'm sure you all know. Uh, in fact, we were in Ireland and uh, we got a private tour, come in in jail and uh, saw his execution site. And I happened to meet a descendant of his. I don't know if it was a grandson or great grandson, Sean Connolly, who's actually a building rep at Dublin Teachers Union. Uh, yeah, and uh, so. Uh, some of you might know uh, Mike Foley, right? No. Dennis. Dennis Foley. Uh, uh, working on uh, doing a uh, musical on James Connolly and an exhibit. So Connolly and Mulaney were contemporaries for just a couple of years in Troy. Uh, and he found uh, some evidence where uh, Connolly actually supported a starcher strike in 1905, which was just was great news for me to get the connection. So we're going to do probably a, a small exhibit on Conley, a James Conley gallery in one of the small rooms or something like that. And we're partnering with him on the, uh, uh, on the, on the musical. So a lot of people know James Conley, don't know uh, Kate Mullaney. So hopefully teaming them up. Uh, we'd love to find any reference at all where they even met <laughs> because it's likely they did, but uh, we don't, we haven't seen anything on it. I'd love to find a photograph of the woman. It's amazing, yeah. like the first national yeah. woman leader, you know. I have a five hundred dollar reward. Everybody come up there, go four or five. Like she's probably in one, one, you know, outside yeah. the thing of a group and yeah. just not bothered to, yeah. you know, name her. But um yeah. So um yeah, so I think we'll finish up. Jack just made a, an interesting comment about the difference between Albany and Troy, that yeah. Troy had been slightly more sectarian we'll call it and so there's a book um the trial of bat Shea, which kind of talks about that there were active orange orders and stuff in troy at the time where they weren't you know here in albany so that was that pause and silence that you heard on facebook um so thanks everyone we're back mm -hmm. on when are we back Thur thursday with uh Oh, God. oh yes, my. we're showing, we're screening a documentary. So for the online people, we cannot screen the documentary because it's a preview. He's actually, he rang me today, he's still editing the film. So those of you who can come in person, we're screening a premiere of a documentary about Father Michael Judge. That's mm -hmm. about 50 minutes long. Naturally, we just had 9-11 on Saturday. Um, and that's part of our immigrant activism series because Father Michael Judge was, um, you know, a great activist for gay people and people with AIDS. And he was very sort of ahead of his time. So we'll screen that film here and then we'll, we will go live with the discussion afterwards. So we have Brendan Fay and some actually some brothers from Siena who knew uh, Michael Judge. So that will happen at about eight o'clock on Facebook, seven o'clock here if you're in person. And then next week we have... Um, Deanne Bland talking about a Civil War soldier who started life in Ireland as Jenny Hodges and became a soldier here, Albert Cashier. And we also have um, the Creameries, uh, the story of Horace Plunkett. And there's one or two other events coming up. So we've got about four or five events left for the rest of the month. Our next event in this series is October 10th, I think, when we'll have um, a performance by Toss the Feathers and they'll sing songs about the canals, uh, factory workers and Civil War soldiers. So it's, it's kind of a musical journey through um, labor history in this capital region. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, our live audience. And uh, we'll see you all on Thursday. Take care. Thank Bye. you.